All right, so back with uh, the next volume of Berserk. And as usual, it is a delight. I do have more criticisms for this one. Not so much criticisms, I just don't like one of the characters so much. Uh, but the chapter starts off with the Skull Knight going through a forest of the burnt corpses of the children of the last start. And if that's just not a way to set the mood as I come back into Berserk after a little break, I don't know what is. And he's thinking about guts, whether or not he can continue on this path as a man or, and he kind of cuts himself off as he finds uh, the behalot of Fairy Lady and swallows it for some reason. I'm... Is he taking the powers of the demon angels, just preventing them from being used in the future? Is he getting something from this or just, again, stopping it from being used in the future? Not sure why he swallowed it. Um, but to talk about how he's, can Guts continue on as a mortal man or supposedly like turn into a monster? And we also see Guts running through the forest as the evil spirits are whispering into his head, psychologically torturing him, saying, you killed children, you are a monster, you're vengeance. Um, you will become all this. You will transform into a monster till that's all you are. Um, you will be a monster pretending to be a man or whatever. And I feel like that's just been a repeated theme throughout the entire thing, that Guts, while human, is t more terrifying than many of the demons that he comes across. And again, I'll never get over in that uh, graveyard, the ghost trying to possess him, and he's saying, no, I will do this as a human. Um, with his own strength, by his own will, he's going to complete his task. Uh, to kill Griffith, and even like the demon monstery things were taking Griffith's kind of face and form, he just slashes at it. And it's it's all very well done, but I am wondering, like, at what point in time is Guts going to have to make a decision between vengeance and humanity, and will he give everything up for power? Because Griffith, again, I'm going with, he chose power and the path he wanted to get to over his humanity. And whether or not that was a choice forced upon him or one he chose freely, was manipulated into, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, he made the choice for power. And will Guts make that same choice? Will he become a more, stay mortal human to and fight Griffith, possibly lose? Or take more power by being corrupted by the evil spirits that are trying to possess him? I'm very interested in that. Uh, but anyway, uh, Puck shows up and he drives the little spirits away. It also might have something to do with the sun coming out. Who cares? Puck to the rescue. Love him. Delight. Angel. Um, and Guts even acknowledges as him calls him by name, basically thanks him, gives him a home in his little side pouch. Before he's been kicking him out, what are you still doing here? No, that's not your house. That's not your bed. That's not your backrest. But now it's just like, no, Puck, that is your home. You can stay there. And it's just, I love, I love Puck. He is welcome. He's a delight. And he's, uh, Puck is learning more about Guts and his past. Uh, later on, there's a vision of Casca and the assault that happened to her. And he understands, he understands Guts' uh, rage and fear more now. Uh, here's when the introductions happen that I'm not so much a fan in. So the Holy Iron Chain Knights people show up and I thought I would like them. I normally like uh, the religious symbolism in stories. The more heavy handed with the religious stuff, it, it's more of a delight for me, okay? I go full crazy like religious zealot or make it more nuanced, shades of gray, struggling with the moral decisions. I'm good with both options. Go to either extreme, stay in the middle. It's normally a pretty entertaining uh, story narrative for me. Um, I don't like these guys very much. So they're fighting guts. First of all, the leader lady, uh, Farnesi, I believe her name is. I could be saying that wrong. I was calling her Fairness the entire time I was reading it. Then I look at her name again, like Farnesi maybe. Don't know. Um, so she orders him, uh, like, we found you, hack of darkness kind of thing. They definitely think he's Griffith. Um, stand down, surrender. You're covered in the blood of the children of the last village. Why have you been doing this? Why are you causing such mass chaos and slaughter? Not understanding the context. I mean, it wasn't not children's blood on his hands, but they were possessed, turned into evil fairies. Okay, they were long gone. It was just the bodies were still the children bodies. But apparently that's not easy to explain. So Guts is kind of just laughing them off when she says, drop your sword. There isn't any, nothing in the world is going to make him drop his sword. Uh, they're all shocked that he can even hold it, let alone when he swings it and kills five of them all at once. But he's very, very badly injured. Um, Puck is somewhat freaking out in his side pouch, like, oh my god, he can't fight this. And he's kind of right, he's very tired. 
Um, so they end up getting the upper hand. He uses his um, missing arm as like a club. And of course, it's a gun. So that gives him a bit of an edge. Um, the second in command ends up trying to fight him. He's more honorable. Um, Guts knows him from an old story where he was protecting an old man on a bridge. I, I want a little bit of the symbolism there. Like he could have just helped the man cross the bridge, but instead just defending him from others who wanted to pass him and slash run him over. So yeah, it would have been quicker to just help the man cross, but I guess letting him cross on his own strength is important to him. Honor, maybe, something like that. Um, but Guts ends up jumping over him to go to, quote unquote, I think the like head of the army, head of the snake, take down the, the leader, but gets shot with a crossbow and she ends up accidentally getting him in his shoulder, taking him down because he's already so injured. Um, the people in the army are very much of, we want revenge for our fallen comrades, but second in command is just like, hey, they went into battle. This was an honorable fight to, we are here to arrest him, not execute him. Uh, you challenged him. He accepted the challenge. Whoever died, died. Like, it would be dishonorable to our fallen comrades to sully their memory by acting in such a dishonorable way by killing him. Again, we're here to arrest him. Um, but what I don't like, I guess it's a little bit interesting. They are all like the nobleman's children kind of thing that didn't want to see actual battle. So it makes sense for why they're so inexperienced. But like Farnese is the leader of this, yet she has no experience. This is the first time she's drawn blood. I'm re really hesitant on how a woman in this time period world got to be the leader of a bunch of noblemen's kids without being able to prove herself anyway beforehand. Like, Casca makes sense. She worked her way up. She trained for this. She fought for this. She struggled for her positionings. Uh, she had that connection with Griffith and gave her opportunities to prove herself. But she did prove herself. Farnese Lady, not a fan. Like, she's just given this position of power. So I'm wondering how she got to that position of power. More than that, I she kind of goes a little crazy by the end. But that being said, I do like crazy sometimes. So we'll see how I feel better by the end. My first impressions are not positive. So she ends up taking Guts back to her tent where she interrogates him, but not before sending away her soldiers. And they're all like, no, someone should stay to protect you. What if he gets loose? He's in this stock thing. He's got one arm free because he can't go up in the stock. Um, uh, she's saying, no, leave me. This is an order. Well, maybe we should get second in command guy to come up and be here as well. Why are you questioning me? She's very much trying to assert her authority through words, not actions. Like she doesn't have the respect yet. And she's saying like, you're questioning me. I'm like, yeah, because you haven't proven your competency yet. But anywho, she starts questioning uh, Guts after they do eventually leave her alone. And it's again, a lot of why are you doing this? She doesn't understand anything of what's going on. No idea of the context and the situations. Guts is asking her, have you ever seen an angel before? Or in this case, a demon. And uh, she's like, no, miracles are left to the heavens. And he's just scoffing at her, which is insulting. So she calls the Behelet a uh, pagan ritual thing. And he's like, you really have no idea what you're talking about. She gets so frustrated, she ends up whipping him. And Guts, pain tolerance of a freaking boulder, like, doesn't even feel it, um, is not responding to her assaults. So she just continues to attack him more, showing frustration, showing inexperience, showing that he's gotten under her skin until second in command guy, bridge knight guy shows up and talks her down saying, you can't be just be doing this like this. So I'm just trying to get some questions out of him before we send him to go be burnt by the holy whatever. Um, she ends up praying to a statue thing. Apparently it's a hawk in flight. I'm wondering how that might play into symbolism because there's like hawk imagery with Griffith. I thought it was a whale tail for the longest time. Um, so Guts goes in his cage and again, beautiful darling moment because Puck to the rescue again has stolen the keys and wants to let Guts out. But first he wants Guts to say thank you. Guts almost rots in that cage and it's a delight, but eventually he does say thank you because evil spirits are coming in the nighttime and he's trapped in a cage and that's not good. They did, the Holy Night people did give him a blanket over it if it like rained or something, I guess, or to keep it the cold. So that was nice of them. Maybe some privacy in the little cage, but not going to keep it with the evil spirits. So he gets out, goes back to the Farnese's uh, tent where she has removed her shirt and is just like whipping herself. Um, 
I'm going with slightly unnecessary, but also it's a vibe. Was this the time of, um, what's it, what was that movie? Da Vinci Code, that's what it was. Uh, that was the vibes it was giving me. I only really remember that scene from the movie. But anywho, um, Guts ends up kidnapping her in order to getting out of the camp alive and knocks her out, threatens to set her on fire so they can let him leave without being stopped, let the horses go, takes one for himself, rides on. She comes to and Guts has to basically threaten to drop her over the side of the horse and cliff and boulders and rocks and everything would probably kill her if she doesn't stop moving around. Now what I do like is Puck is trying to talk to her but she refuses to see him. Can't see him at all. Thinks Guts is mumbling, talking to himself. And Puck explains some people just can't comprehend his existence, doesn't accept it, and ignores it, doesn't feel it's important. So I'm going with her religious mind is warped into a much... Into a sense that, like, refuses to believe in spirits and creatures like elves. This is not in the Bible or whatever Bible they're following. Then it can't be real. So just refuses to process it, maybe. Um, but another member of her organization, I think, supposedly can see him. So interesting that she's just very far gone. Now, eventually, evil spirits attack. There's the guy who's kind of like a fencer in the Holy Night is coming to save her. I'll just refer to him as a third in command. Um, the one saying that uh, Gut should stop pissing her off. Uh, but he gets kind of knocked over by evil spirits coming. And uh, Farnese has to watch as Guts fights the evil spirits all night long. Like, this is the first time she's witnessing a supposed miracle, which are demons in this world. Angels and demons, same thing. Um, she tries to make a run for it, ordering the horse to stand up so she can mount it and get away. Ma'am, you can't just tell an animal to do what I say because I'm in charge. But of course, horse has been possessed by a demon and is about to assault her. And that is putting it nicely because my God, the imagery is very disturbing. It creeped me the hell out. And I'm like, yep, that's terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying right there. Um, Guts, however, has like a flashback to Casca being assaulted and is just like, no, not having this, not on my watch, not when I can do something about it, never again. Uh, easily, thankfully, thank God, kills the horse. I did not need to see her assaulted by a horse. Um, and she is absolutely losing her mind watching Guts uh, fight. But eventually, sun does come up and... She's about to regain a semblance of reality again, only to hear the voices of those spirits whispering in her ear, playing on her insecurities, playing on her fears, playing on what she sees as sins. As she's think as the voices in her head is telling her that, oh, you are attracted to this man. You are attracted to the pain and pleasure. And when you were hurting him, you were getting enjoyment for that. And it's slowly creeping into her. And she's completely naked at this point in time. I think the horse ripped off her pants. Yeah, she's completely naked. Um, still tied up though, but the voices convince her that it's a good idea to try to seduce Guts by straddling his sword as she tries to choke him and then tells him to raise the sword up to slice her in half straight up the middle. Listen, I watched the I watched Terrifier, okay? The scene at the end guy who's it was just a scene it was a scene no issues no issues how how did those panels give me physical pain I'm like nope nope this hurts I can feel this one I can appreciate now when like movie characters like get kicks between the legs and the guys all feel that pain I'm like yeah it's very funny no, her her straddling the sword saying raise it up and slice me in half I'm like yep nope that is that is an uncomfortable feeling so very disturbing. Thankfully, thankfully, the sun rises to its full extent and uh, gets rid of those uh, creatures from her mind. And she's Guts is able to get her off her. But that's when uh, Fencer Buddy, third in command, I guess, shows up. Um, and surprisingly not confused by the situation, does not think she has been assaulted, I don't think. She, however, is telling him to kill Guts because defend regain my honor kind of thing like does she think she was assaulted or just very upset that she had these desires and put herself and acted the way that she acted just a minute ago does she know she was possessed she gotta know she was possessed um thankfully um her comrade does not fight guts saying he would probably lose and also they are supposed to arrest him not kill him 
So he uh, gives her some clothes to take her back. And again, ridicules gut saying, I told you not to piss her off. Now you pissed her off again. Um, she is now fully on kill guts, I guess. So he doesn't say what she's done and tarnish her honor more. Don't know. Um, there's a quick little fight between guts and third in commands guy that shows both their skills. They both react to each other very quickly, injure each other in similar ways, very small scratches. And I'm interested in him. He's, he has a interesting vibe about him and I want to see what his goals are, both with the Holy Knights and just with guts with the situation. I feel like he might be knowing more than what he's letting on. Overall, first impressions of this arc are a little bit more negative than previous arcs, but I'm easily won over by crazy religious cults like people, or even just religious people that eventually realize there's gray in the world and you can't just strictly follow the rules in the whatever Bible they're following. I'm good with both storylines and easily won over by either one. So Excited to see where this continues on. I like that Puck is learning more about guts. I wanna, I wanna like Farnese, but I just don't like how she's in her position. But that being said, if we explain how, who put her there, why she's leading this army despite having no experience, it it might make more sense. So very excited to continue on, and yeah, I will talk to you later. Uh, but let me know if uh, this arc is going to live up to the height of everything that came before it, or is this a little bit of a lower section before we shoot back up in quality? Does it level out? I've, I've just been enjoying Berserk so much that I'm holding it to an extremely high standard, and it really can't stay as good as it's been for that much longer. We gotta have a little bit of a low, I would think. But all right, I will talk to you later. Bye.